I've been looking for an opportunity to have this discussion about it. Exactly. Today I'm bringing folks back to the table. We've got a camera here. A few finishing touches. Let me get a mic up and just before we continue a discussion we started a few months ago. Hello, hello. In May, I invited 20 parents from different backgrounds to join me for dinner. I feel like if diversity was really a priority for my family, then I would do something about it. I wanted to examine the conversations parents have with their kids about race, racism, and identity. Right. It's like we have to explain that our, that our bodies matter. What goes into protecting kids, making them resilient? This is how you say my name. Yeah. Don't mess with it. And proud to be who they are. And at home, we listen to a lot of music in Spanish. Four episodes aired on King 5, with black, white, Latino, and Asian families. <laughs> Today, two people from each episode are coming back. For the next hour, we'll bring you some of the highlights from those episodes. In the car, we were speaking Spanish, and then when we stop and we park, we say, OK, English here, OK? And then we're going to dig a little deeper. You may be trying to get through Thanksgiving dinner. Right, I'm exactly. trying to get through the next 70 years of life. Exactly. I'm bringing in Professor Rolina Joseph from the University of Washington to help us out. My name is Jenna Hancher. I'm no expert. I'm just a curious journalist who hopes we can all learn from our experiences on race and parenting. So thank you all for coming. We finally made it here, so thank you so much for being here. Help us understand a little bit, while race is a, is a social construct, it, it's very much real, right, in terms Absolutely. of how we function and how we interact. So race is not something that we know is, is biological. It's something that was created hundreds of years ago to separate people, to divide people, to be able to exploit people, to enslave folks. Racism, the structure of racism, comes from these notions of race. Racism, of course, being the structures, the institutions that come from this discrimination. We think of racism as being something that might happen interpersonally, but that really can only happen when someone has institutional, structural power. We have these conversations because they're the experiences that we as adults are having, and we bring them home and talk and negotiate through them with our children. But they are the conversations that white families need to be having with their children as well. All of us need to be invested in these conversations of race and, and, and of racism and how they permeate our lives. Yeah. Would you want to say grace now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. God, thank you for this food we're about to receive for nourishing our bodies in this time together in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Yeah, get in. Hallelujah. Yeah. I think every black person, black child, black anyone in general, um, there uh, be uh, comes a moment when you know that that you're black. When did you all kind of first realize you were? You were black. I was playing soccer in middle school, and we were, I was the only black girl on the team. There was an opponent's team, and they were kicking me, they were pulling my hair, they were doing different things to me, and then someone called me a racist slur. And a, a fight broke out, and I was expelled from the whole program. And my parents were livid, and it was a big ordeal. And I remember sitting there like, what is happening? You know, and why is this happening? And my parents having to sit down and have the conversation with you, like, this is happening because X, Y, Z, you know, and you're black. And although you're light skinned, you are black and people see you as black. Are you all more aware of your code switching now? <laughs> are you are we aware of it? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Well, it's like a daily fight. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. It is. I had to I had to code switch for police officers that came to my home after two drivers crashed into my home. And you know, when they finally got to us, I was, you know, I had to tell them, you know, I'm a real estate broker. I own this business. I'm this, I'm that. Mm -hmm. You know, I have two very small kids in here, and right. I had to go through my whole resume. resume. Yeah. My partner's a lawyer, you know. Right. I had to go through my right. resume to them yeah. and and tell them who I am, you know. Right. 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 It's like we have to explain that our that our bodies matter, that our bodies have worth, that our bodies yeah. have have you know weight. Um, there's always this concept, and, and that and that actually is what code switching gets to, right? Is it's it's to it's to really show, hey, I'm not one of those type of persons. Um, I am an expert. You're an expert? I, I'm an expert. Oh, wait, 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 w
has, has been, been how do you how do you embody a, a black body in white spaces, mm -hmm. right? Especially in Seattle, how do I embody yeah. blackness in a sea of whiteness? Mm -hmm. um, and, and how do you do it? Yeah, it it really is this method of what can I do to ensure that um, that I'm able to advance, mm -hmm. and how do I hang on to the fact that. Um, that I do like fried chicken, but I won't eat it in public. Right. Mm -hmm. That I do love watermelon, but I'm not going to eat it around you all. Right. right. <laughs> that I that I do enjoy these things, but mm -hmm. no, 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 actually, yeah. no, I'm fine. Right. 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 It's, 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 you know, how do you, it's right. a constant right. sacrifice, right? right? It is this constant um, struggle and tension that we have to live with just to, ex just to exist. I mean, and, and, and I actually tell, 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 uh, tell folks, I say, you know, I speak two languages, um, uh, right. English, I am bilingual. Right. I speak English uh -huh. and I speak white. <laughs> you better put that now. That may not show up on a resume. <laughs> but but right. let's be Your qualifications. But let's be real, in right? English and white. It is. Well, no, yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, right. Um, that's a great point. Yeah, it's, it's because a, a lot of what we do, I think, <laughs> as black, I mean, it's true. It's it's are the true. things to make white people feel more comfortable right. around oh. us? It's about right. their safety. It's about their because safety. If I threaten you, my life could be ended. Yes. If you feel unsafe as right. a white person, right? right? And that's that's a as a black man, I don't feel comfortable jogging down the street and yeah. be better not put a hoodie on mm -mm. and go yeah. jogging, right? Like, because if you're running, then you are either did something wrong or yeah. you're about to go That's do true. something wrong, right? And do you think you'll have a conversation with your kids about that, with your two boys? I mean, because yeah, you have man. two black boys. Two black boys. Go to the gym, son. Don't, don't be running. <laughs> don't, be run don't be running in the streets unless you got a ball in your head. <laughs> and that's bad too, right? Yeah. Like, I first wanted to start off by giving anyone an opportunity to kind of respond to the first episode. Like, what did you think about it? What were your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Those who were in it, those who weren't in it. So anyone can start. I would have loved to share just how exhausting it is sometimes oh, yeah. and how mm -hmm. my son just graduated uh, two weeks ago and my husband and I were like, I was shedding a tear because we made it. Yeah. First, because he's yeah. alive. Right? Yes. He's 18, he's alive, he graduated. And we're just exhausted. I feel like from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade, it's been a struggle and a fight um, in the school system, in our community. Like, it's just exhausting. Um, and now with my daughter, she's in, she's 14 in ninth grade, and we're just gearing up for the, we're already in it, right? We're already in yeah. this fight of this institution that's constantly trying to, to oppress her and tell her that she's less than. Um, but as a parent, Sometimes I'm like, I'm tired, I don't even know why, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I feel we all go through that, but there's like this extra yes. layer. First of all, I just want to acknowledge that pain and, mm -hmm. and just to say that, that holding that heavily every day um, yeah. is, is such an incredible um, and disproportionate burden. Mm -hmm. We're talking about disproportionality. Mm -hmm. This is not something that all parents have to experience. <clears throat> one of the things that I did want to bring up in that episode, which is one that came up a lot um, in some of the responses too from people was code switching. Yeah, code switching is is a survival strategy, right? It's learning how to perform your identity differently in different spaces according to what feels safe. Can I make a quick yeah, comment you can go about go right code switching? I, yeah, I love that that was in the episode because I felt like it's a good tool as a white person talking to other white people about how. It's a struggle to be a person of color and how they have to change, you know, how they behave. And that everybody does that in a small way. I don't do it for survival, but I do act differently in front of my mother-in-law than I do out with my friends, right? That we change the face we put on or the face we put forward, depending on the different situation that we are. But add that for a person of color, the weight of safety and the weight of feeling legitimate and being recognized. Um, it just felt like it was a great segue and a conversation piece yeah, to start. And I start think where the difference relate. is, though, is that a mother-in-law versus an officer. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Like you're, you're, you, you may be trying to get through Thanksgiving dinner. Right. I'm exactly. trying to get through the next 70 years of life. Exactly. And yeah. that's, that's the sort of jumping off point of, you know how you were like this with grandma. Well, you know, mm -hmm. Derek has to do that. Mm -hmm. 
all the time in any white space and with a you know officer and it's fearing for safety. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think it's really important not to make false equivalencies. Oh, sure. So to be really clear about, you know, this is, it's an important, it's important for children to understand this is a way for you to understand. Yes. At the same time, if we're talking about fear of, um, of the police, yeah. if we're talking about in this moment of, um, of immigration, mm -hmm. right, and all of the fears that come from speaking Spanish and the very real um, fear of being separated from a child, and so we need, we need to also understand that the construction of equivalencies can be a problem. We see yeah. in this political moment right. that, that there's been all kinds of false equivalencies that have been constructed in order to downplay mm -hmm. and, um, and to make light of, of the racism that's happening. Mm -hmm. so, so I just wanted to throw that in there yeah, yeah, as yeah. well. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. If you look at all the episodes together, it's just so clear that, that racism is a white person's problem. Watching your episode, I was like, oh, it's interesting, right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I want you all to feel free to, like, talk and jump in. I mean, this is not like, you know, you don't have to raise your hand or anything like that, so we just jump I, in. I sometimes do it because I'm socially awkward yeah. and because like, <laughs> I'm a teacher, but I know, like, yeah. I know. That's what I want my students to do sometimes, so uh, I'll do my best not to raise my hand. Yeah. So for you all, when was the first time you realized that you needed to talk to your kids about race? I had a really good conversation recently. My daughter came home from school and just kind of out of the blue, she said, like, we learned about slavery in, in school and it made me really sad, mm -hmm. right? So it was, a, it was a great opening for a conversation mm -hmm. and just kind of led to me asking more questions. What about for you, Beth? I mean, you're, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think out of necessity, it came probably earlier than maybe it would have had I had um, a white child. Friends at preschool would say, that's your mom, you know, mm -hmm. when I would come and visit. Well, I mean, I remember a turning point for me in terms of how important I thought it was. Um, and that was when I watched for the first time the video of Eric Garner um, pleading for his life and saying, I can't breathe. Um, and it hit home for me, okay, this actually is happening. Um, and so I wanted to take more of an active role in addressing some of those issues through my work, but also with my kids. It's similar that my daughter was just wondered out of nowhere from the back seat of the car, um, why is it always on the news a white policeman shooting a black man? And she was maybe five at this. So thinking like my kid is not thinking this deeply at this point was. Whew. What about for you? He brought up the N word one time, and so just so he I was able. How did he? How did he bring that up? He, so that happened at school, and like I was like, okay. And when that happened at school, how did it happen? Like, did someone say it? Like, he what? had heard that that is just a bad, that's just a really bad word, and I was trying to contextualize it. How do you all feel when you get asked those questions? I mean, when they, I, I mean, I remember when I asked my parents like weird questions, they'd be like, oh boy, okay, now I got to talk about it, you know? Like, how do you all feel when you get when your kid walks into your house and says, I heard the N word right. today? When they're bringing it up, I'm like, oh, let's go, let's go, and yeah. try to bring as many different resources and make them animated as much as I can. And so I, I, I'm fortunate, but again, I, I still wish like the school system would be doing, would be, would be practicing some of this as well. All right, episode two. You're looking at me? Yeah, we're all I'm looking at, I'm looking at you. You don't have to say I anything. Oh, I, want to I am looking hard. at you. <laughs> well, like you said, I think the episode was a good, it was a good start, right? Right. But I think if we were to go deeper, mm -hmm. and especially if you look at all the episodes together, it's just so clear that, that racism is a white person's problem. Like, it's like white people created this system, yeah. and, and all these groups of color have to do the parenting to, to survive within this system. And so we need to start having that conversation, or more white, everybody's having the conversation, but more white people need to be having that conversation that they need to be doing more to make sure your kid's not so exhausted, that you're not, everybody else is not having to cater to white people's comfort. Right, so, right. White people need to get more uncomfortable, need to practice getting more uncomfortable, and it's their job to help undo it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I taught something to a group this last week of adults, and someone, um, a, a white person, innocently asked me a question, which is basically, if I say something racist and there's no people of color in the room, is it still racist? Oh, jeez. And the answer to that is yes, but I think yes. that's right. <laughs> right. 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 right, which, right. which, which should, should be honest. Maybe another word right. in front of that. <laughs> 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 right. 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 
but, but I think that the, the point is taken. One of the things that I I, I came across is what was that um, outside of yours, John, which was a very real life situation of your son coming and talking about we heard this word on the playground. Everybody else has felt very constructed and contrived to me, and hmm. very much like a choice. It seemed like yours came from this is a real life. This happened. Everyone else. It felt to me as though. Um, these conversations were actually not happening naturally in the household and so when they were brought up in studio it felt uncomfortable it felt forced it didn't felt it didn't feel natural to me mm -hmm. watching your episode i was like oh it's interesting right um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um let's I, unpack that Darisha. what you mean <laughs> i mean it's just interesting to hear like the perspective um but i when i start hearing white people use the language yeah sometimes i i, I turn a side eye yeah. because i've seen that become a weapon like i've seen it oh, be yeah. very 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 uh, dangerous mm -hmm. especially like in the corporate space or in school because they start throwing mm -hmm. that language back at you mm -hmm. And to validate, like, I am, you know, I understand oppression, and I, I would right. say, like, fake woke. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 right. You're so fake woke. So yeah. I, I immediately get really like, oh, gosh, here we go. Like, right. I'm not trying to hear no one else tell me about their whiteness. Right, right. right. Um, Because I have. I've seen it be used, thrown back at me, thrown back at people, mm -hmm. just to validate, you know, or to try to cover it for their bad behavior. Sure. Um. So I don't know. Like, I... I like, I, I, I was able to empathize because mm -hmm. I was like, gosh, I don't know. Like, <laughs> how do you have those conversations with your kids? We have it because we have to. Yeah, to right. Keep my kid alive. Right. Um, and we deal with it every day. But I don't know how you would consciously make that decision. Like, let's just talk about race. Maybe right. in that yeah. same vein, right? Where we are, we are, I have had these conversations with my parents, you know, so that I could be alive. Yeah. Uh, but maybe in that same vein, the, com the conversations need, need to also shift towards this is what you do so you don't kill anyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, absolutely. This is what you need, need, yeah, need, need, <laughs> need to do so you don't get anybody fired. Right. Right. So that you don't call the cops when someone's barbecuing in right. Oakland. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a very intentional yeah. and serious right. conversation, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and maybe having that same type of uh, vein, that vein of intentionality. Intention is really great. And I think also looking at impact, because I think mm -hmm. a lot yeah. of people do intentionally, like, I'm a nice person. I didn't mean right. to do right. these things. Right. So the intentions are good. But I also think we should also be looking at our impact on right. our actions. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, am I moving into a certain neighborhood that's primarily black and historically mm -hmm. black? Um, what's the impact I'm having by taking up space, centralizing whiteness? Mm -hmm, am mm -hmm. I giving, am I letting folks of color, women of color, queer folk have a voice at the table? Right. I know we talked about this briefly, but how do you all wrestle with or do you wrestle with living in predominantly white communities and moving in predominantly white spaces. Our son is Ethiopian and so we have a connection with the Ethiopian Community mm -hmm. Center which has been wonderful yeah. um, but we do live in a little Ballard, white Ballard bubble and um, we really struggle with you know not doing enough to create more racial mirrors for our son. Yeah I feel like a hypocrite a lot of the yeah. time oh, honestly yeah. um, because I feel like if diversity was really a priority for my family then I would do something about it and I wouldn't be in this white Ballard bubble where I live and my kids go to school and I work. Um, so I guess I try to do what I can within that space. Recently, um, my health insurance just changed and um, we had to find um, our son a new doctor. And I really wanted him to have a black doctor. Yeah. And so I asked his old doctor, we used to be previous Kaiser clients, you know, about if she would make a recommendation and, and she, she couldn't think of a black doctor to recommend. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. What, what were you going to say? Sometimes your only options are choosing a very racially segregated neighborhood mm -hmm. or, or if you're trying to make sure that y your kids are with a diverse group of people, you could be part of the gentrification. It, it's like I want to make it meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to just go out and say, okay, let's, you know, find some black people to hang out with. Right. You yeah. know, right. I mean, yeah. so, uh, it, yeah. I feel oftentimes like we're falling down on the job. It almost feels like this bind of like, okay, yes, almost everyone in my neighborhood is, is white, um, not everybody, but, and sh you know how, but I don't want to move to the <laughs> middle and then start bring all my yeah. white friends and let's you know that sort of white savior <laughs> complex too of like, hey, let's go change this neighborhood around and like it was like, okay, you just brought five Starbucks with you, like what, what are you doing, you know? <laughs> I think 
we also have to understand and take responsibility for the fact that if we have all white friend groups, we need to talk about that with our children, mm -hmm. right? For those of us who are white. And what does that mean and what does that look like? Mm -hmm. um, if we have our children in schools that are that are predominantly white, if, if all of their, um, their caregivers, if their doctors and their dentists and everyone that they see in positions of authority mm -hmm. are all white, that is a conscious choice, mm -hmm. right? We need to make sure that we're making these choices that seem like they're not racialized, that we're, we are making these racialized choices and these decisions. Those of us who are parents of color understand them to be racialized choices when we're choosing our caregivers for our children, mm -hmm. right? And white parents need to understand that if you're really choosing a doctor, it's not just a random, oh, I'm just choosing this doctor. If you're choosing just the first white doctor that you're seeing, that's a racialized choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're a white family and you only hang out with white people, there's a, probably a good chance that you're not doing much to push the needle toward racial justice if you're exclusively always in, in, in white spaces. And so that's right. something for white families to cross-examine. Like, what am I doing to, like, if I have the privilege not to experience racism, what am I doing to put myself in the line of fire so I actually have negative race-based experiences, which will often come from white people. That's often the backlash that will come. Probably the yeah. people who said, why are we talking about race? Right. We're probably disproportionately white. Probably oh, not yeah. all, but disproportionately mm -hmm. white. Mm -hmm. And so white families need to be asking, like, what am I doing to push it? Mm -hmm. And if I'm, not do if I'm not getting any backlash, there's probably a good chance I'm not doing anything. Mm -hmm. Just watching the news yeah. coming out, of kids being separated, that just hits home. Mm -hmm. well, in your episode, though, you, you, you then said you also checked the white box. Yeah. So you've been Hispanic, Latinx, you've been Asian. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. So you've been Hispanic, la I, Latinx, you've been Asian. Racial <laughs> 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 And I can't say, well, it's so. Code switching on a whole different level. <laughs> right, yes. right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So the census that was started in 1790 um, didn't have a category outside of white and slave. For years and years, there were variations of those categories, and there was no category that was known until the Hispanic category was introduced by the Nixon administration, right? And so um, folks who were of Latinx or um, of Mexican descent who were living in the United States for centuries um, could have chosen any number of things on the census. So it makes sense that people don't know, really know what to check because these are fabricated, constructed categories that are not in alignment with the ways in which racialization happens in home countries, right? Um, and and the government hasn't hasn't quite caught up. And stop this small town. Now I speak Spanish with my daughters, and my wife speaks English with them. Mm -hmm. So when we stopped at a small town, my wife's like, "Stop! They can't speak Spanish here because we don't feel comfortable. We don't feel welcome." With my kids, I kind of have the same experience like you, like going to a restaurant or something. We have to say, "Okay, here we cannot speak Spanish," so we just speak English. So, and then in the car we were speaking Spanish and then when we stop and we park and say, okay, English here, okay? We don't want to, because uh, I, I don't want them to feel, to feel kind of, you know, bad. Because sometimes you can get in a place and people don't really say anything, but you can feel it. You can, the, uh, how they looking at you. Yeah. But you're doing that to protect your kids from exactly. feeling isolated or feeling... Exactly. How do you create an environment for your kids where they can appreciate their culture, their race? I think my kids brought the culture back to me in sixth grade. I started pretending I didn't know how to roll my R's or, you know, really speak Spanish and... So you were uh, trying to hide your... Identity. Yeah, I was trying to hide my identity. I was trying to mix in. Even though I was living in Southern California where a lot of my friends spoke Spanish, I was still trying to do that. I think having kids, I've just really embraced it gone back to listening to Spanish music that I grew up listening to, um, you know, enjoying them or showing them soccer. Uh, <laughs> football. <laughs> football. No, it's el football. Yeah. It's football. And then even though they're sometimes they're like, no, no, papi, that's not football. Football is <laughs> it's where you throw the ball. So um, I'm like, no, that's football americano. With my son, uh, we went to Colombia uh, for uh, when he was four, and that actually helped quite a lot. We they had the World Cup. Everybody was football, big thing. Everybody was uh, basically how we were, mm -hmm. and uh, that helped quite a bit. And at home, we listened to a lot of music in Spanish, uh, Spanish rock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he has his favorite songs, and he started singing them and stuff like that. So that mm -hmm. that really helps in the culture. You know, when Coco came out, that was so cool because oh, it was yeah. finally like a grandma that was like my grandma. Mm -hmm. um, you know, very scolding with her chancla in her hand. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, the music, the mariachi. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we even practiced a few times the El grito, the um, <laughs> the scream that you do, oh. and I'm not gonna demonstrate because oh, I'm not very good. <laughs> One of my kids came crying, say, "Mommy, you're uh, you're Latino, so that means you, they're gonna take you away." So he start crying and I say, "No, honey, the, it won't happen." And I say, "And because of that, we have." To, I have to teach you more about my culture and show it to people that we're not bad people, that we do other things too. Was that hard for you in that moment? It's still hard. I was going, yeah, it's still hard because, yeah, that my kid came and saying, like, are they going to take you away, you know, just because somebody say it. And so, yeah, it's still hard. It's, it's still, but I think now they kind of understand that, uh, that it's not, probably it's not going to happen. But if it happened, I mean, we just, Fight. Um, and I definitely wanted to get your takeaways. <laughs> you, Inma, and you, Alex, I wanted to get your takeaways from the episode. This past few weeks have been um, harder for me because just watching the news coming out of kids being separated, 
that just hits home. Mm -hmm. And that's a, usually we have those conversations at home right away. Yeah. That's a conversation that I've avoided. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to tell my daughter. People mm -hmm. are being separated from, mm -hmm. from their parents, your age, older. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think I need to have this conversation. I just don't know how to have it. Um, all of our children are being inundated um, with with these images, and so it's up to us to have the conversation. There to be responsible and have the conversation about what is immigration policy like right now, yeah. Yeah. Um, and how do we and how do we treat each other? How are we valuing human lives? What are borders? Why have they been used, and how are they being used right now? Whose land was this? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, to have to have that mm -hmm. real conversation. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also I think that I also hear in your voice this fear of kind of wanting to be the big strong dad mm -hmm. and not to fall apart in front of your kids. Mm -hmm. um, but but I think it's also okay to show your your children vulnerability around this because these are these these questions of of race that that tear us apart. Um, I think it helps to give our children strength to see yeah. how much it affects us, mm -hmm. right? And yet how we, we, we struggle through them and we cry through them and we scream through them, but we make our way through them, right? And that's how we get strong together as a family. It's how we get strong together as a community by talking about them and strategizing and figuring out how to move forward, right? It's the silence that kills us. I don't know how to continue that conversation, but then when I get into other spaces, it's like, why is the Latino guys the one that's bringing up deportations and kids being separated? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, can we empower others to really mm -hmm. create a, mm -hmm. a movement, some change mm -hmm. in yeah. our communities, right? So we all look at each other as human, because mm -hmm. uh -huh. I feel like we look at immigrants and they're those people, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It's their struggle, it's like, we don't know how to own it as a society, mm -hmm. as a community. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm 1.5 generation Cambodian American refugee. Um, a lot of the issues that um, are collateral in terms of yeah. deportation, mm -hmm. uh, racism, access to education, mm -hmm. we, we, we bear the brunt because we came here under dis distress. So when we talk about immigration, a lot of times it's uh, from a, like a Latin American and American perspective mm -hmm. or from Arab American where mm -hmm. um, Cambodian Americans have been de deport deported since 2001, we, but nobody really knows that, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times we're so stuck in our own ethnic bubble mm -hmm. um, that we can't see outside of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think for marginalized communities, this, we, we, we don't hold the keys to the doors, right? Um, so our power's in the people, our power's in the numbers. Mm -hmm. So um, seeing that everybody has these shared struggles, I, I, I hope, and this is some of the work I do in community too, is mm -hmm. like, how do, we, how do we layer resources? You know, mm -hmm. How do we find, how do we asset map each other's uh, um, w w experiences and then um, you know uh, meet each other to a place where we can all like collectively um, have one voice. Um, but you know folks of color we notice when white folks don't look at us or mm -hmm. we're not being seen. He slipped up and said that somebody left a note on his lockers to call him a chain. All right so let's dig in we got chicken kale apple salad, we have these carrots which have a little bit of a kick to them, so if you don't really like spicy, uh, that may not like be spice, it. Yeah, you I'm like spicy? Sure. <laughs> I think everyone here probably <laughs> Let me know if it's yeah, good. When did you all first start talking to your kids about identity, about race, about how they're seen in the world? So my daughter was reading about Martin Luther King and Gandhi, mm -hmm. and uh, she was saying, wow, they, you know, Martin Luther King learned from Gandhi and so on. and. Mm -hmm. So she's uh, having this conversation with my wife about, you know, what the experiences were uh, for a lot of uh, black people over here and so on. And uh, suddenly she says, whew, thank God I'm white. And uh, my wife uh, didn't want to correct her right then. She said, tell me why you feel that way, right? So she wanted to have the conversation. Why do you feel that way? And so my daughter, uh, five and a half, says, well, I've never had any of that happen to me, so I must be white, mm -hmm. right? And, and so that's where my wife talked about, uh, well, you know, really, color is not the way to define people. Mm -hmm. But if we were to define that way, then you would be brown, mm -hmm. Indian brown. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. And, uh, and guess what? Even in India, the same thing uh, happened like 70 years ago when the Britishers were ruling brown skin people couldn't go into some clubs, couldn't go, you know, they were restricted, there was segregation there as well. Mm -hmm. And that's why Gandhi had to fight for that and so on. 
What has it been like for your kids moving in predominantly white spaces if they do? It's if, if I'm out with them, say at a store, I will tell them, keep your hands out of your pockets and don't act suspicious. And my husband doesn't he doesn't have to think about these kinds of things because he's, you know, white guy. <laughs> um, love him dearly, um, obviously. But, like, he just doesn't have to think about these things. I have a similar situation. If I am alone with my child, I think about, too, like, how am I dressed? How am I going to be red when I'm walking down the street? So if I'm dressed, dressed like, nice now, which is professional, like, I'll be treated differently versus I'm wearing a baseball cap and a hoodie, and then people will think I'm much younger than I am, which is nice sometimes. <laughs> you don't raise them. Yeah, no, right. So, but like then one. you don't want to have a reason. I think, um, yeah, I, I get worried because how we're going to be treated. All right, we're moving on to episode four. So, <laughs> what were some of your thoughts? A lot of white folks actually passed me and my oh, husband, yeah. Yeah. and that's the thing of like being seen. I, that mm -hmm. didn't make a cut about mm -hmm. like Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. A lot of time, I think sometimes um, we can be seen as the my model minority oh, myth, yeah. and that's also part of not being seen. I, we don't in our family we don't believe in that because if you disaggregate the data, a lot of our our APA mm -hmm. IPI community is so diverse, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. a disservice mm -hmm. to our identity and also folks mm -hmm. who are really struggling. Um, but you know. Folks of color, we notice when white folks don't look at us or mm -hmm. if we're not being seen. Mm -hmm. um, and we're watching how we're being seen. Mm -hmm. And I think my son is kind of picking up on that. So mm. I'm looking to my mm. right. friends here on right. my left and right of like, you have older kids, so I'm listening. And I'm hoping mm -hmm. like to tap into you for community support because my kid's younger and your kids are older. I knew racism was happening growing up and it was happening to me and friends and whoever, but until I got to college and where you started to put labels on things, you're just like, damn, it was all happening. Like, you know, I remember the time somebody said, I don't want to, like, I'm working, I don't understand what you're saying, can somebody bring somebody that can speak English over here? Like, you know, things like that. You know, it's happened throughout my life, and it's one of many, right? Mm -hmm. But now that you, you, there's labels to it, you kind of like, damn, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what's happening, and now I want to, like, instill all this in my son, and so he knows you know, where the landmines are and, they, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna blow up, but how do you recover from it? Um, you know, the other day my son came home singing this, like, ching chong, you know, like, jangling song. I'm like, where in the world did you learn that? And it was one of his buddies who had started singing that. I said, do you realize that that is very offensive? And he, my son didn't know because he had not encountered that before. Mm -hmm. That was the first time. Wow. And now he's aware. And how old is he? He's eight. So young. Mm -hmm. And <sighs> it's, it, and you're like, wow, we're, our little Seattle bubble is not. <laughs> <laughs> Even in our <Right>. bubble. <laughs> You're shaking your head. You got yeah, it is. It's, it's baffling to, um, you know, on the surface level, like, I think Seattle kind of prides itself in being such a liberal bastion, and, and you wouldn't imagine that, you know, these type of inequalities um, happen, but if you just peel it back. So when you were talking about that what happened to your son, that happened to me in the 80s growing up um, and I had a very much a reaction of like it's still happening today yeah. of that Ching Chong song and as a child I knew it was wrong I'm like but in the way I was like well they're wrong I'm not even Chinese so <laughs> but I knew what they were saying was wrong it made me feel bad because it made me feel different yeah I want my daughter to have those tools that I didn't have when I was in sixth grade and came was going back to class from the water fountain and a parade of children from another class went by and someone did the Ching Chong song. And it was actually another child of color. But I was so embarrassed and humiliated because it was in front of an audience. I think in elementary school I used to ask him, like, who are your friends? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I'd be like, okay, what race are they? And then he'd be mm -hmm. like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And then middle school, mm -hmm. kind of in the beginning, I'm the yeah. same. What are they? Just because I want to Mm -hmm. try to identify mm -hmm. w when he conceptualized that. But then mm -hmm. one day in sixth grade, he, t he told me um, the story and he slipped up and said that somebody left a note on his lockers calling him Chink. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, how come we never heard of this? It's like, mm -hmm. well, so what happened? And, mm -hmm. and, and he told me it happened some months ago. Mm -hmm. um, teacher found it, found out who it was, took care of it. And I was like, well, how come, yeah. you know, nobody told us? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. that's, that's, right. that's, that's, that's important because yeah. 
that's when I can step in and let's talk it out. And how important is that, I mean, do you think, uh, to have, to teach your kid to have those, what could be considered a tough conversation um, to somebody in power, to somebody white, the teacher's white? Yes. Okay, to somebody white, before I spit facts, I don't know. Um, to someone in, in power, to somebody who's white, and to negotiate, to say, hey, I'm feeling this way, and um, you know, I would like you to know this, and, and how important is that? I think it's incredibly important. Mm. Um, and I mean, clearly, like all the work that you were doing for so many years, and he was pushing back on you and say, I'm not talking about race, I'm not talking about race, I'm not talking about race, that, that, that paid off with him being able to express and articulate his feelings and talk about his experience of bias and his experience of being discriminated against in the classroom there. Like that was, he was taking all of that in, even though he wasn't telling you, thank you, dad. Mm. I really appreciate that. You schooled mm. me on, on, on how to speak back to racism there. Um, that was that was valuable, and that will only. I mean, he's only in sixth grade, so that's going to continue to Seth is going grow to be. Yeah. before he gets yeah. mad at me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Middle school, right? right. Um, that he'll be able to continue continue practicing that, because yeah. um, yeah. I mean, and that that's speaking back to an institution, right? Mm -hmm. The the teacher who there is is the representative of the institution. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. powerful. Right. So. I think it's a conversation we continue having, but at the same time, we highlight the good progress and the hard work that people have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All this is being recorded, by the way. What's that? The cameras are rolling I know, already. Right? Yeah. I know there are a lot of groups of people that aren't at the table yet. We don't have a marker, so I'm just going to clap. Don't worry, these conversations are just the beginning. Looking back now, I mean, I would right. encourage all new parents to right. start that early. For now, I hope you at home will have something to talk about over dinner. It's always empowering for me to be in a space where there are people that look like me and have the same experience. It's validating. I would just like to ask other white parents to be more willing to have these kinds of conversations. Oh, yeah. Thank you for doing the series. Oh, yeah. I hope you'll leave with a better understanding on yeah. race and parenting. I think it's a conversation we continue having, but at the same time, we highlight the good progress and the hard work that people have mm. made. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you were able to join yeah. us. Yeah, Absolutely. thank you. Thanks thank for you. having me. Yes, thank you. And thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. I hope you all enjoyed it as well. Okay. We thank you too. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Such an amazing reporter and giving us space to yeah. talk about this and for King Five. It just kudos to you just leading thank the way. So oh, thank really, you. really yeah. lots of praise. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all. This is about like including the stories that get left off. Yeah. So I don't know. I think they. No, I think they're great. Thank you. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for coming and sharing. Let's see it right.